Aloha, everybody. Welcome to the Hawaii Verse Podcast, a podcast that supports local by pooling kalo when you're young and then pooling your back when you're old. I'm your host, Kamaka Diaz, and I am still pretty young, but the aches and pains are so real already. Before we introduce our guests, I just want to remind you all to check out my Patreon at, at patreon.com slash kamakadias if you're interested in supporting me and this podcast that you're listening to. This is an independent podcast which we do for free and for the people. So if you love the podcast and want to become a part of our ohana, please check it out. You can sign up for as little as $3 a month, and I got some awesome perks there. Shout out to my new Patreon supporters, Dana Sanchez Terry and Tiffany Karamoto, for signing up for the $10 a month Kako Otier. Appreciate you both. Okay, enough about me and Patreon. Let's introduce our guest. Our guest today is a native Hawaiian politician and community organizer from the island of Maui. He was a former member of the Hawaii House of Representatives from the 11th District representing South Maui from 2012 until 2018. This local brada currently serves as a national director of the Green Network, where he leads national campaigns to combat climate change. He serves on various coalitions, including Our Hawaii, Climate Power Advisory Board, and the Hawaii Community Bail Fund Board of Directors. In 2014, he introduced a bill that was signed into law to provide a same-day voter registration law. He is not afraid to go toe-to-toe with anyone, including Mark Zuckerberg, if necessary. He is Vivo Ole, and I am so stoked to talk stories with him today. His name is Kaniela Ng. Aloha, Kaniela. Welcome to the podcast here at ID8 Studios. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. It's, it's good to be here. It's impressive what you set up. <laughs> Mahalo. I appreciate it. It's nice to meet you. And I love seeing everything that you do online, you know, for the Lahui. Uh, people like you are what we need for, for our Hawaiian community for us to progress forward. So I, I just keep doing what you do. <laughs> and we have a lot to get into um, and a million Instagram questions for you. But before we get into all of that, I just got to start at the beginning and ask you, where are you from, where are you grad, and what was it like growing up? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm from Makawao, Maui, uh, Paniolo town, you know. Uh, country. Con- country as a Country with own care. But my dad was from Pololo, so they, he moved there. My mom's from Maui, like four mm. generations. But all my friends was into rodeo. And oh, we wasn't really. really, and like we never hunt, so I had to kind of like learn from my friends mm-hmm. and all that. But then, um, you know, working class, uh, my mom worked Liberty House, but then my dad passed away. Oh, that's a throwback, Liberty, Liberty House. House. I forgot about that. That yeah, was right yeah. before Macy's, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she did oh. the shoes. She did the shoes there, and then um, she did art on the side. But then mm-hmm. my dad, he, um, he like suddenly passed away when I was 11. Mm-hmm. So then had my mom and then the four kids and my grandma living. So I was working pineapple fields, you know, at 14 years old, wow. trying to help with bills. And we grew up really American style. Like, as long as you work hard, everything's going to be fine. But we realized, like, that's not the case. Like, we was bossing ass. My mom was working two jobs. Mm-hmm. And we still needed help from the church, from the government. Um, like, we needed support, you know, mm-hmm. Social Security, all, Medicare, all the stuff. Um, so it, it kind of shaped my views. Mm-hmm. coming into college and we like none of my parents went to college so we, we was like a first generation so you know you grow up you're not thinking like none of your none of your friends dads or moms are politicians or lawyers mm-hmm. or doctors uh, they're like firefighters and that's what you try to be are, yeah but those are good jobs mm-hmm. um but it never crossed my mind that you could like run for office mm-hmm. um, up until college so that's when i really got into it but yeah, it like really shapes where you come from definitely shapes who you definitely. are. So it's I'm the nature versus that. nurture kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah. debate, right? So where did you grad from? Oh, yeah, I grad from um, Kamehameha Maui in mm-hmm. 06. So we were the first class. So it was kind of interesting because people think of Kamehameha, they think of the polish. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, this guy. But like we was all from public schools come eighth grade. Mm-hmm. And then we came in and the teachers was from public schools. So it was kind of like the guinea pig class. Yeah. And, you know, we never had upper classmen. So in some ways, like... We always kind of taunted on because oh, so you guys was ninth grade and yeah, then yeah. tenth grade you guys had ninth graders exactly eleventh grade you had tenth and ninth graders yeah oh, but wow. they were still kind of figuring it out as yeah. all construction happening um, so th- I think that was part of it too it was just like made me a little bit weird in my personality because like there's like on one hand no one to keep you in check on the other hand like you in this private school and you come from public school so I was getting detention like every weekend like little stuff not tucking in your shirt talking mm. back like you know it's not speaking properly that kind of stuff yeah. so like they, they would uh i guess punish you for speaking pigeon 
uh, well, not like detention, but you know, it's like frowned upon. Mm-hmm. The the t- shirt tucked in was kind of gnarly. Yeah. You couldn't wear like a logo on your on your mm-hmm. hoodie. Like it was real strict. Um, even this, like if your socks don't go above your ankle, mm. automatic detention. So why, why is that? Do you think? I mean. Yo, I don't, I don't know if I should get into <laughs> it on this podcast, but like, look, 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 I, uh, look, I should, I should, in fact, like, so like a year ago, I, I said KS was, I said I went to, like, a, what was founded as a residential school. Mm-hmm. So there's these schools across the continent made made to kill the native and save the man, mm-hmm. um, and to kind of force assimilation on on native kids, and KS, one of the most notorious ones, is called the <clears throat> the Carlisle School. And KS was actually modeled after the Carlisle school. Hmm. But I said this, right? Like, there's this picture of this native, and I said, like, that, like, being assimilated as, like, a meme. I'm like, eh, this was basically me, and I explained my story. And then some people got offended. Some people in KS got offended. Um, Well, the DOJ just put out a report last year that included KS as, like, a residential school. Hmm. Um, So, I mean, since I went there, it's changed a lot. Um, but it was founded as an assimilation school to actually prep us as mostly soldiers in the military and to be like good, um, you know, productive workers, not wow. necessarily leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, that's changed a lot. They're doing amazing things now. Mm-hmm. There's like new leadership there, like Noi Goodyear Kapua, like solid Kanaka leading it. When I was there, I was like a random Holly guy leading mm-hmm. uh, headmaster and uh, Pookula on Maui. So um, it's good to see the progress, but. You know, I think the history of, of why the schools are the way they are um, is is important to know. Yeah, and it makes sense with the kind of authoritarian kind of uh, principles of it, where it's like you, it's like almost like military, right? Tucking your yeah. shirt all the time, walking a straight line. You yeah, can't have longer than yeah, you, yeah. So you can't like have like moves. long hair or whatever, right? Yeah. So that makes sense. I didn't, I never really understood why it's like that. I can see them just wanting to teach people discipline Mm -hmm. but when it's not explained it's kind of hard for kids students to grasp like why are we doing this nobody ever says why you're doing it they're just you do it because we tell you Mm -hmm. there's never an explanation right and i think that's hard for kids growing up having to listen to these people but not know why you're just following blindly i mean it's not even a criticism of the Mm -hmm. school because they taught me how to make like this the world is set up on purpose for people of a certain race, people of a certain gender to succeed before others. And that was codified into a lot of our laws, right? From like way back in the day where you couldn't even get a 40 year mortgage unless you're a white man. You couldn't Mm -hmm. even vote unless you're a white man. And like generations on the line, there's still repercussions. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not like, it's not like it didn't help me. Like I, I know how to wear a suit. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's I, I don't know if I would have been as successful as a politician if I yeah. wasn't if I didn't have that education and that background. So, like, on one hand, like, you know, they, they want to set up these Kanaka to succeed in a, you know, essentially a white man's world, like mm-hmm. a capitalist world. And you can't really fault them for it. Right. You got to change the conditions underneath it. Um, and and like and the institutions and the public at large. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's why I organize. Yeah. And what's interesting is we live in this modern era where things have changed where a Hawaiian now doesn't look like a Hawaiian back then. You know, you don't like look at like you're looking so fresh with the Nikes, the jacket, you got a chain on. But like, I'm sure there's I some West Side now. There's, so. there's some there's some <laughs> West Side. <laughs> Did you roll up in a lifted Yoda? I wish. Or, yeah, or yeah. dropped one day. Drop. <laughs> one day. Um, but then you got you, you probably got some people like very old, like old school. Like they think like, oh, that's not how Hawaiian's supposed to look. You know, or like even like you could have some people saying like Hawaii's not supposed to, you know, be in politics or whatever. You know, you got that really old school way of thinking. So like what what would you say to those people now who are like, that's not what a Hawaiian is supposed to be? Yeah, I I mean, you hear it from both sides, mm-hmm. right? Like some say how oh, we had this, con- this conversation at the convention. There's this panel and it, we're talking about the media and how they portray Hawaiians. And one of the panelists were saying, like, don't don't be rowdy, you know, like don't protest and stuff because mm-hmm. that's what they're gonna put in the media on the front page. The long-haired Hawaiian, looking all sloppy, mm-hmm. and rather to be buttoned up. And it's mm-hmm. like, is that what we're gonna tell our kids to like try to show up, not show up as your full self, and to like act like, you know, the 
the colonizer culture or are we going to try to change the conditions where it's okay to show up as mm. our full selves um you know so me i like to be clean cut sometimes other times you know i had hair past my shoulders mm. like you know just depending on how i'm feeling mm. and it, every time i think back like what would a hawaiian do it's like hawaiians were never a monolith back 100 years ago hawaiians had different points of view just like today Mm-hmm. I just got to remind myself, like, I'm Hawaiian. So when I think about, like, what a Hawaiian would do, it's just, like, just follow the na'au. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Always got to follow your na'au. It's, it's, it's tough, too, when you see certain people on social media, like, they're portraying, like, certain things, and you're like, okay, that's the standard, right? It's like, do I have to be like them because that's, like, widely accepted, or can I just be myself? So there's a lot of insecurities. And, um, it, personally, like, Oh, I have to speak a certain way. I have to look a certain way. I have to have a certain job to be considered local or Hawaiian, you know, and that's always a struggle, you know, even for me growing up as well, you know, it's like, oh, I always wanted to be Tanner. I, like, I, I wish I spoke a little bit more pigeon, you know, just so I could be seen as more Hawaiian, even though I spoke Hawaiian, right? But then e- even with that, I still felt insecure, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy because of our culture was taken away that we're still trying to discover how what our culture even is in this modern day right Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's crazy um before we get into um more stuff i wanted to go back about the kamehameha stuff because uh i remember talking to some people uh just saying like hearing cam kamehameha kamehameha you know the ways to say kamehameha ks is there a proper way to say it what's acceptable what's not acceptable i hear ks Cam, I heard not to say Cam because it's like you're cutting the name short, so you're taking away the mana, the power. I've heard that before, but people still say Cam. Um, people just say Kamehameha. This is like it's kind of like a you're not really saying the H, like saying Hawaii. Mm. It, it's it's not saying the Okina. Um, or should you always say Kamehameha? What's the What's the accepted? Hey, just don't say Bishop Estate. That's <laughs> all I ask. <laughs> Me, I mean, I'm not the, you know, I'm not the arbiter of what's, yeah. uh, of the brand, mm-hmm. KS. If anything, coming out of male schools, if anything, I was like, they didn't think I was going to graduate. You know what I mean? Like, I was that guy, so, um, Well, you what know. is your personal opinion? So, Kamehameha is, you know, one of the most profound ali'i, mm-hmm. one of the most, like, famous, respected Hawaiians mm-hmm. out there. Um, I was I was surprised recently on my Instagram. Guys was just attacking Kamehameha, the great, over and over. It was, it was strange. It was a bizarre thing. But um, I guess he's still a controversial figure. But that's Kamehameha. But, you know, KS, Kamehameha Schools is, was founded by Puahi. Mm-hmm. Often, Charles Reed Bishop gets a lot of credit for it, which, you know, in my opinion, um, it was more of like a political marriage, and he was much older, and mm-hmm. there's some strange implications there that I think we don't talk about a lot. But it was really founded by Puahi, you know, it's her resources. Um, and KS is more than just schools now. It's like they're the second largest landowner in Hawaii. They're nine, I don't even know what the number now, but billions of dollars mm-hmm. um, endowment. So... Uh, it's it's kind of strange just calling it a school mm. nowadays, right? It's like such a powerhouse in Hawaii, yeah. and it's like a brand. <laughs> yeah, it's just and it's like a it's like a cultural signal, yeah. and it's like a status symbol. You mm-hmm. put it in your car, all of a sudden you're not working class knock anymore. You're like elevated, and yeah. that's where it gets kind of weird. And when you talk about like what it means Hawaiian to be Hawaiian, there's like you know the academic point of view like you mm-hmm. got to know all the knowledge and it's okay if you don't speak pidgin mm-hmm. anymore and then there's the other point of view that's more like culturally rooted like you know how in touch with the people are you and how you dress and how you talk all that matters and then there's like this the gap in the middle mm-hmm. and you know i think i i i don't know if you agree with this but our generation was like you just got to get educated like you gotta you gotta hold on yourself as an individual and if we can all do that, if we all become doctors and lawyers and all that, like, that's great. And it is great. Like, that's how you build a nation. Yes, but we're thinking too individualistically. Like, we're not thinking community. So what happens is even when you become that lawyer and you're doing great things for the lahui or whatever, or a politician, you get sucked into this bubble. Mm-hmm. And then you start talking only in that bubble. And you, you say things, you know, like, you're in the safe space. So you say things like, Christianity is wrong. No one's punishing you, but you say that in like in the middle of Nanakuli or something, 
you know, consequences, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So, like, we got to, like, part of the work that I do is trying to bridge those divides. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's less like ILH versus OIA, Kanaka. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a, that's a, such a good point because even um, if you go a little lower, too, it's just the, the debate between private and public school kids is is such a real one in Hawaii. Yeah. It's not really a thing on the continent. Mm-hmm. When I talk to people, they don't they don't really care as much as over here because we got the we got the public and private school, just the way you act, your people's attitudes, and then we got the sports. You know, that's another that's another debate where people like public school um, is not as good as private school because private school has all the resources, stuff like that. Um, what what's what's your opinion on public versus private? Is one better? Just different situations. I mean, like I, I am who I am because mm-hmm. I went to public school up until eighth grade, and mm-hmm. then I went to Kamehameha, and you know, I might have not gone to college if not for Kamehameha. Yeah. So you know, I owe a lot to them. But on the other hand, like, I just feel like I'm a little different than like people who spent their whole life in Kamehameha or Punahou or Iolani. Um, those are the people that I'm around a lot because of politics. Yeah. But you know. At my core, like, he's a public school boy. Yeah, bro. I grew <laughs> up like <laughs> a you, certain way. Do you think that being put in private school almost puts you in this bubble? Like how you're talking about the bubble within as you move up as a, you know, in your career, it's almost like you're in a bubble. Do you think the private school also has that sort of bubble as well? Oh, well, I can speak on a political context, mm-hmm. right? So, like right now, the majority of Hawaii is Democrats. Mm-hmm you see a tide changing within the Lahui where a lot of Hawaiians that used to be Democrat is now going Republican. And is it just because they agree with the issues of the Republican Party or is it more of a cultural thing? Mm -hmm. You know, is it like Democrats, I feel like lost touch of the local culture in a really big way. And they they just talking about the national issues and like trying to hammer it home like by force. But then like, it just... The way like I've been around these guys, yeah, and there's like mostly representatives from the mainland, or they're from mm-hmm. like political families, and they're just so out of touch with like regular working people that like I don't blame them for hopping over to be Republican all of a sudden, mm-hmm. yeah. So it's like culture is at the core of everything, and if you can't if you can't like keep in touch with with where the people are, um, you're not going to be successful in whatever you're trying to push, be mm-hmm. it like you know union rights or or Mauna Kea or whatever it is, mm-hmm. like you're gonna lose people very quickly. Um, yeah. Especially when the other side, it has like tons of money for ads and all that stuff. Yeah, and we, we've we been seeing that a lot in the last couple of years, especially with the last election that just happened. Um, it's it's crazy to me to see like um, the, the division that it creates just between like the two party system and it's like, but it, when you think about back in the days when we had like a uh, Kuhio, who was a re- Republican, right? Mm-hmm. And he w- he was, I guess, a, a politician uh, for for Hawaii. Um, he he had certain beliefs, but what I've heard is that the beliefs, the values of the Republican Party back then, it's changed a lot since then. So now it's like you can't really use the argument. Well, like Hawaii was used to be Republican. Is it, do you have any mana on that? Well, I, me personally, I try not to get too hung up mm-hmm. on the on the political parties. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason why I ran as a Democrat is because I support Mahu, Two Spirit, you know, LGBT rights, and that was like a big issue when I was running. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I support equal rights for women, like all that kind of stuff. And the Republican Party is just right now pretty bad at that stuff. Mm-hmm. But at, when you look at like issues that actually help working people, it's like. There's a question mark, like mm-hmm. which party is better? Like Democrats are better with unions, but when it comes to like, you know, actually talking about like what working people really care about, and like Mauna Kea, for example, I've seen more like Republicans that supported Mauna Kea than or saying stuff about Red Hill than Democrats right now. So, you know, it's like uh, I try to focus more on the issues. Mm-hmm. And Kuhio was the same way. Kuhio mm-hmm. was just a Republican. He created a new party, Home Rule Party. He said. He said, look, all these business owners, these, these Japanese business owners over here, all these Howley, like, you know, colonizer families over here. Like, what if we did our own thing and just focus on on what matters? Like, Hawaiians need homes and uh, created a new party. So, like, I think there's 
there's appetite for that here. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, it's not going to happen unless we kind of get to the core of, of the issues mm-hmm. a little bit more rather than just blindly following yeah. um, American colonial constructs of the two-party system. Yeah, I agree. I don't like the two-party system. I think it's, it's you support individual issues, and I don't think you need to put a label on it, like what you are conservative liberal whatever it's like yeah you support hey, what you support let's talk issues like <laughs> if you don't want corporations to drill into sacred places like Mauna Kea mm-hmm. if you don't want the military to pollute our water source our drinking water or kidnap our girls if you want to house Hawaiians if you re- want to regenerate our aina and resources uh, then you need to care about money in politics mm-hmm Right, replacing a Democrat with a Republican or a Republican with a Democrat is not going to fix anything. Electing all Hawaiians aren't gonna, isn't going to fix it because they're going to be standing on the same pillars, the same institutions. Because power is not monolithic, it's social. Like They're only in power because we validate them through our cooperation mm-hmm. right, and through these institutions. So we actually got to invalidate the institutions they stand on. All the corporate donors, the luxury developers... And we got to support candidates who don't take their money. And that's hard. When you don't take their money, they come after you. They, yeah. they, they trash you in the media. They do lawsuits. They do everything they can to drag you down. Mm-hmm. And we got to see through it as, as the public and be like, hey, like, just because that person has the best signs doesn't mean they're the best candidate. In fact, they might be the worst candidate because where did that money come from to buy all those signs, well, right? Because they, they were bought out. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And I know when you ran, you were one of the candidates that didn't take any corporate money. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And it was hard because then when you do that, you got to get like kind of like your Patreon, right? You need mm-hmm. like $10 donations from choked people. We yeah. have 15,000 donors um, in order to compete. But uh, Whereas if you take a corporate sponsor, you can get like $100,000 check, boom, right there. Yeah. Something like that. And you, yeah. and you have like support for like your, you know, your mm-hmm. reporting and your lawyers. So yeah. like you, you're never going to get in trouble. And then, you know, if you don't get that, they're going to be suing you and they know you're vulnerable. Yeah. So like... It's it's tough, yeah. um, but like, uh, it's not just a matter of supporting the candidates too. It's like having these conversations within our communities about the issues, of, and because even if it's not these big issues I spoke of, if it's a pothole, trash mm-hmm. pickup, late buses, yeah, right, I guarantee you can trash it, tra- trace it back to money in politics at mm-hmm. some point. Yeah, so you always like, gotta follow the money. You gotta follow that, the money. Right? Yeah, that's one thing I learned in the last couple of years. All right, so. After you graduated from Kamehameha uh, on Maui, where did you go to college? And how did you get into, you know, what you do now? How did you start getting into, like, the, you know, the, how did you start in Kue, you know, start, like, this Kue movement? Yeah, I mean, my first, like, big protest was when John Doe got into Kamehameha. It was, like, 09. And... Wait, was, is that when they started allowing um, people who aren't Hawaiian? Is that what that is? I don't know. What yeah. So it's like this guy, anonymous. Okay. Didn't get in. Howley guy. Mm-hmm. So the family sued KS. Mm-hmm. And if the family won that lawsuit, it would have been like everything that all the programs, right? Like DHHL, um, pretty much everything you think of would yeah. be decimated. So uh, it was like got challenged all the way up to the Supreme Court. But there was like big protests at the time where like 10,000 people was marching with their red shirts on Maui. So when you're in that space for the first time and you, you've you been taught your whole life to like assimilate, but all of a sudden it's like, Brad, all the people around me to see the world the same way I do, and it just feels good. I'm like, this is must, how howlers must feel all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, that's a good point. Like, yeah. damn. So you feel like powerful. Well, well you, you feel part of the majority now. Yeah. So you, your whole life you're the minority. Yeah, in, yeah. in, in Hawaii nonetheless. Yeah. So then you just feel that's where I got that bug. So mm-hmm. I knew right there, I was like, okay, this is like that, that Kuei thing. It just like, it lit the fire. And you know what? We all have Kuei in our blood. Like mm-hmm. my my grandpa, Holly Mano, he got called by McCarthy to testify in Congress saying like, oh, they're plotting ILWU. He's like, I don't remember. They're plotting a takeover of the U.S. government. Mm-hmm. So he had to like testify and prove he wasn't like a communist conspirator against the government. Oh, and all this. Like, Yeah. Like we all have stories like that. Mm-hmm. Like if you're Hawaiian and alive today... Um, there's Kuei in your blood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's 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 something inherent that we have. It's just like you you wake up and it's just in, in this intrinsic feeling where it's, you just wanna 
go against the grain sometimes. And I, I feel that too. I mean, like my whole life, I, I've, it's very unorthodox, you know, going to Hawaiian Immersion School. That's Kue. You know, joining the Peace Corps. That's cool. I, I didn't get a nine to five job, you know, mm-hmm. starting this podcast, talking about whatever we like and not, you know, just taking a big corporate sponsor and have talking whatever or promoting whatever they want to promote. You know, that's yeah. cool. Eh? I think a lot of the things we do, even if you don't know it, it's cool. Eh? Yeah. And the idea of AR as like the collective AR, mm-hmm. but but also the individual AR as in like the main character energy, because mm-hmm. We, we never seen up until Aquaman. Yeah. We never seen, I never seen people are like me in the movies. Mm-hmm. How is, how is, they, they, they look at Superman and they go, hey, that's like a career choice for me. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. like obviously I'm the main character. So like, I think that, that idea of like, uh, that, that's what I want to instill in, in mm-hmm. our kids. Representation. Right. Just like, just like, yeah, like you're at the center of your own story. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't have to fall. Because you're saying, like, you know, they have a prescribed track, of basically, of, like, where Hawaiian should fall. And, like, part of Kua is just doing your own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, like, if you don't see yourself as, like, the main character in your own story, then that's going to be hard to do. Mm. Um, so, you know, that's that's something we try to, like, yeah. You're the main character. <laughs> just, like, remind folks. I love it. Yeah. So where so this this all came about in 09 um, during the, um, college. And where did you go to college? Oh, yeah. So I went to um, Maui Community College at the time, was called. Um, and first, I went to University of Utah, Western Undergraduate Exchange. It was real cheap. Wanted to experience the snow. Mm-hmm. Wanted to um, get a different perspective just for a semester. They went to Maui and then went to UH. And UH is when um, I realized there's like more out there. Mm-hmm. There's like different kinds of jobs and paths you can take. Uh, and there was a... 70% of the student population was in-state, local. Mm-hmm. 30% was out-of-state. That was the cap. That was the most out-of-state you can do. They wanted to lift the cap. And the student government was supporting lifting the cap because the student government was 95% out-of-state. <laughs> was one fraternity, all, like, rich, yeah. certain kind of guy. Um, and, like, they spent all the student government money on, like, Oktoberfest. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, not, like, super non hawaiian event. I mean, cool, you know, I, don't, yeah. I drink beer. But um, we we did a campaign, put the Hawaii back in UH, mm-hmm. uh, got some T-shirts donated, took donations like ten dollars each, used that to buy like you know barbecue stuff, flyers, mm-hmm. and ran a, ran for president and took out the vice president by like forty votes, Oof. and the whole Senate hated me because they're all like his friends, right? Um, but then from there we like yeah, that's when I really understood that you could do like electoral stuff mm-hmm. and do like real change so you know um we did a bus pass it used to be like 400 dollars mm-hmm. for a bus pass for a semester but then we did what if everyone just chip in five dollars ten dollars and everyone get a bus pass doesn't matter if you're rich poor mm-hmm. whatever everyone supported that why wouldn't you support mm-hmm. that you know and i didn't realize at the time that was socialist or socialized policy mm-hmm. but like medicare social security but it was super popular mm-hmm. um so that's when i started realizing like okay maybe this electoral thing on um, path to leadership is is something i could do mm-hmm. you also realized early how every vote matters <laughs> yeah, you 40 won by votes. 40 votes and <laughs> yeah, i think yeah. people ask like does my vote matter that's an example right there yeah. it might not matter in like the presidential election when there's so millions of votes but on a small scale like that your representatives said like the districts oh it matters oh definitely yeah. guys win with like one two votes brenton awa he did he he had a come from behind victory yeah, yeah. and won by a few votes like that's an example yeah. and we got a hawaiian in office love it yeah i mean i i should because i mentioned earlier that it doesn't really matter to replace people with hawaiians mm-hmm. it matters <laughs> it matters but like more importantly is like shifting the public because once a Hawaiian gets in same donors right mm-hmm. they got to respond to the their voters too if they're not conv- if they're not on our side on the Lahui side they're gonna have to respond to their voters anyway that's their job mm-hmm. um, so if their voters are against the Lahui agenda or, or support the TMT for example um, what do you expect this Hawaiian legislator to do mm-hmm. right so that's why community organizing is so important okay what what is community organizing what's the definition of that and why is it important I mean you got to it's it's like when people ask me like what's the one thing they can do to really affect change is it vote is it you know 
shop buy local mm-hmm. like yeah those things are important but like the number one thing to do is build community mm-hmm. like we're, we're purposely isolated right let's just take care of your family family first but that's never how we operated as a lot we are any native people whether you black brown hawaiian navajo sioux whatever uh society was always like it takes a village to raise a child yeah or an ahupua. <laughs> yeah, or ahupua style. <laughs> yeah. And it was like to the point where our values were way different. Mm-hmm. Like if you hoarded wealth or like if you hoarded by resources or anything, it was weird. Mm-hmm. Like you didn't admire someone because they're rich. You got your social status by giving. Mm-hmm. The more you gave, the more popular you became. Um, and even if you like, if you're a young man and you like had a good hunt, you know, you got the pool, you brought it home, like you don't get all the credit. In fact, you ever had a grandma be like, you cook for her or something. She's like, yeah, this tastes bad. Or like <laughs> kind of make fun of you. Huh? Yeah, that yeah. was meant to pe- keep people like us, like young men in check for a mm-hmm. reason um, because everyone, the credit should be spread around. So it's like, who made the, who made the spear tip? You know what I mean? Like who made the fish hook? Like th- that, that person gets more credit than the person who made the hunt. Um, and that, that kind of value system is what, like when we say like, how can you be more Hawaiian? It's more like, it's more about that. Then we can still be modern. We can still have microphones and phones and all that. But like, why are we valuing someone just because they hoarded more than everybody else Mm -hmm. rather than doing what we tell our kids to do and share? So kind of digress there. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a good point. I think because the Western society is an individualistic society and we were colonized by America, so this mindset that we we have a lot... subconsciously a lot of times is 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 individualistic where we're taught to have these in gain these individual accolades to level up to you know reach a new new status so because that's how the structure is right yeah whereas um hawaiian values and beliefs is you move together as one like you know american culture you you climb to the top by yourself and then maybe you can bring up everybody. But Hawaiians, like, you go to get, you go to the top together. Yeah. Because you can't make it to the top by yourself. Yeah, rise with, yeah. don't rise from. Yeah, yep. exactly. So I, I, I love that you said that. Okay, so um, I, w- I want to know what is the relationship between the um, two-party system and Kanaka? Yeah, so, I mean, we covered it a little mm-hmm. bit. We covered it a little bit earlier, but um, when it comes to... Yeah, when it comes to Republicans or Democrats, like, yeah, no, we we went through this one, huh? Yeah, we but do you one. have anything else to to add? Uh, I would say that there's more that unite us than, than and this is going to sound cliche, mm-hmm. but there's more that unite us when you actually talk to, like, people that voted for Trump. A lot of people, like, Democrats are like, ah, like, those are bad people. Mm-hmm. I'm like... Well, no, they're not. They're just people that don't, that like can't afford taxes. Mm. You know what I mean? And like, I wouldn't like, yeah, but taxes are so important. Like, I agree. You know, mm. I went to public school. I like, I like roads that don't, that don't mess up my car. <laughs> like taxes are good. Um, but it's also the fact that corporations that donate money have rigged the tax code mm. and they, and they pay less. Amazon pays less than you probably for this business. <laughs> like, is that fair? You know what I mean? So like, Republicans agree with that mm-hmm. when you talk to them. So it's like, how can we have these real conversations and actually come from a like place of listening? When I was 22 years old is when I first ran, mm-hmm. right? And there was this guy who I mentioned I relied on these social programs to survive my family. He wanted to cut all of them. So at the time I was at DC, I was working with OHA. I flew back and I'm like, I'm just going to run against this guy. And everyone said, don't bother. They said, this guy has five times more money than you and all your friends combined. Yeah. <laughs> you only raised $2,000. This guy has 50000 The Democrat and the Republican I was running against. Mm. Now, you know. But, so did you, but you ran as a Democrat? I ran as a Democrat okay. because that's, you know, that's, uh, again, that's what I believe in mm. on some of the stuff more than the others. But um, there was problems with both parties, the same donors. Mm-hmm. So what I did is I worked at Four Seasons um, at the spa cleaning the weight room, folding towels from 4 a.m. to noon. And then I just knock on doors till sunset, like 200 doors a day, and just talk to people. So I ended up knocking on, I did that for like 
hundreds of days, um, knocked on like 12,000 doors oh. and then won by a lot. Wow. So at first it was like just me. And then by the end had everybody signed waving. And these weren't people from organizations. You know what I mean? They weren't like organized people. They're just random people from the community mm -hmm. coming out. Uh, so I say this not because it's like, oh, I was brilliant because I wasn't. It just all I did is knock on doors. You, um, you, you worked hard. <laughs> but yeah, I say, I say this because it's like <laughs> that was supposed to be a Republican district. Mm -hmm. People think Kailua is a Haole district. Mm -hmm. 68% Haole. My, my district was 82% Haole. Mm -hmm. Even more. This is South Maui now. The median house at the time in Hawaii was 500,000. Um, over there was 1.2 million. So it was much richer than the rest. And I'm like this working class, you know, like, so when it comes to two parties, and they said, don't bother, you're Hawaiian, it's a white district. They said, don't bother, you're working class, it's a rich district. Don't bother, you're a Democrat, it's a Republican district. But I just listened to what they wanted. And you know what they wanted was a new high school. That's not Republican or Democrat. So I came in and I got him a new high school. So mm -hmm. then I got reelected and reelected and reelected. So I'm just saying this because like one way to hold Mana Lahui and not not everyone needs to do this, but like run for office. Mm -hmm. You're 21 years old, 22 years old. You're not. You, so people are gonna tell you pay your dues. They're mm -hmm. gonna say. Go in the system first, be a staffer. But what's going to happen? You're going to get in that system and you're going to get inundated by the system. And mm -hmm. you're just going to become one with the ship, like Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like what we need is your fresh perspective. So mm -hmm. just go for it. You mm -hmm. might win, you might lose, but I guarantee you can come out stronger and the Lahu is going to be stronger for it. Mm. I love that. That's awesome. So you have this, this va whole iron value that I see is Viva Ole, you know, fearlessness. Uh, you you just go up against somebody who has more money than you. You're 22 years old. Uh, you you're just like I'm. I'm gonna do it. You know. Even if you tell me I can't do it, I'm gonna do it. You know. You uh, even in I don't know what year it was when Mark Zuckerberg was doing some things. Uh, you ev even quit against him, right? And that's that's a powerful guy. That's Facebook. You know. That's that they own, I don't know how, how much of this world they own. Uh, where, where does that come from? Is it just because you're Hawaiian? Or like, it's, how did you learn how to be fearless? Like, how do you, how are you able to do the things you do? I mean, it's kind, but I mean, I, I experienced a lot of fear, especially now with the kids, bro. I'll tell you what, it's easy, it was easier before I had the two kids. Mm. Now I have two kids, like, there's so much to lose mm. now. Because before, it's like, what's the worst they can do? They can hurt me, put me in the hospital, which, you know, I had my car broken into. Like, stuff happened. They, 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 they hit you with stuff. But, like, when it's your kids, it's like, if your reputation gets tarnished, then their, their prospects at life get tarnished, too, mm -hmm. right? So I always have fear. Um, but it's just, like, what's, what's on the other side? Like, if mm -hmm. you don't have this sense of urgency that cuts through the fear... Like, when it comes to running against that guy, George Fontaine, it was his name. If he actually was successful in cutting those programs, and there was another person like me who lost their father and, you know, needed help, they wouldn't make it. They might be homeless. You know, if he had his way when I was 12, I would be homeless. So it's like, that's what drives you. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And I feel like a lot of the things you do, it is, it's for others. You know, it's not just for you to get, I don't know, recognition or social status. Well, it's not worth the haters. You know, if I wanted applause, I would have joined the circus. Right? <laughs> or I would have I just stopped music. I would have stuck to music because that was mm -hmm. my passion. You, mm -hmm. you talk to anybody who knew me in high school, they're going to be like, what? Politics? Like, we thought you were just going to do music. Mm -hmm. um, or now that I'm trying to get back into music, just messing around mm -hmm. kind, everyone in politics go like, what? what, what? Yeah, music. who's this guy? But it's like, you know, like, th th you do it because, like, I mean, it's not worth it's not worth it. People like, OK, you get Instagram followers or something like it's not worth that. Mm -hmm. The stress is so much worse to have somebody that you grew up with. Right. And you see them at the grocery store or something and they don't want to make eye contact with you because you voted there. They work at A and B mm -hmm. and you voted against their water, their water theft bill. And or you, you know, they work for Monsanto and you voted against the pesticides. You vote. You have this pesticide bill to, to, to stop them from spraying around kids like you lose friends 
Yeah. That's just not worth it. It's not worth the clout. You know what I mean? Like, you got to have another motivation. Mm -hmm. That's what saddens me the most about uh, the times you live in is just because you disagree with somebody, it's a huge issue and you can't be friends anymore. Just because you like blue and I like red, we can't be friends. Yeah. Because you like Doritos and I like Cheetos. You can't be like, what has like this this world come to where we can't even have different in opinions and different in taste and the things that we like? It's crazy. Yeah, and yeah, yeah people get surprised when I say this because they think like, oh, you're, you're like you're so strong on your beliefs and like you obviously we know where you stand and like you're not compromising. And it's like yes, but I also know that I wasn't always there. So when I see someone who's like just coming into politics and never thought about it and they don't agree with me, like. I was there at one point, too. So, like, Mm -hmm. you got to meet people where they are. And Mm -hmm. I feel like that's one thing Democrats have been really bad at. They just kind of stand on their soapbox and, like, preach down to people. Mm -hmm. But it's like, why do they think the way they are? Why do they support Trump and all? Mm Because he's saying real shit, you know? And, like, you're not. Yeah. So um, that's always, like, when when you say, like, what's community organizing? It's, like, meeting people where they are, having Mm -hmm. real conversations, listening more than you're talking, and then starting from, like, something small like the, they need a new stop sign in the community deliver on that get a bunch of people together call call you know the politicians mm-hmm. call the corporation in Ho'opili right now on west side we're like just fighting these power lines that are coming up like deal with that first earn their trust then you can talk about other issues mm-hmm. but you can't just be preaching at people huh? yeah definitely okay so um before we get into um our our fu- Cool segment from our sponsor, KTA. Uh, I want you to talk about something that happened pretty recently about a protest at your child's school because everybody has a lot of questions for that. And it, it kind of went viral. I think it, I mean, I don't know what the definition of viral is, but it went viral locally at least, right? <laughs> and I saw I saw one of the, the videos where you're carrying your kid and you're walking with the sign and this guy tr- tries to grab the sign and almost hits your kid. Like, like you said, how <laughs> now there's yeah. more repercussions because you have kids now, right? Before, like, if you were hit, you know, well, okay, cool, you know, you, you have a cut, you're a little bruised, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But I could imagine, like, if that guy had tried to grab the sign and you fell or something and your kid fell, what the repercussion would have been. Like, I wouldn't have blamed you for getting up and trying to scrap that guy, you know? Yeah. yeah that would have that been totally valid. Um. But if you guys haven't seen the video, go to Instagram. I, I don't know, or YouTube. I don't know. Got to be somewhere. So it's somewhere. You know, things <laughs> just spread like crazy here in Hawaii. Um, but tell us about that event, what happened, and um, yeah, that, that whole protest at your kid's school. I, I want to hear your side of the story. Um, well, I'll tell you what. Like, I, I've been a politician, so I know what's popular and what's not. It's kind of the nature of the game. And I know that if you want to score brownie points and get the public on your side, you don't go after the number one rated politician of all time, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that wasn't my choice as a target. But I did understand, like, it could be a flashpoint moment. Um, but here's the thing. I didn't know that Lincoln Day was 2,000 people because it was my first time going. <laughs> I thought it was going to be like 30 people. So, <laughs> so that was the one thing. I didn't know all politicians go. I'll get there. I text. I have a text. I can show you. I'm like, car. I'm like, what? You know, like, well, you know, like, what is going on? Um, a lot of politicians here. And so, you know, you, you, my, my son said this in the news. They interviewed him. Obviously, like, he can think for himself. If you listen to his interview, he's mm-hmm. talking to a reporter directly. Just yeah. like... And if you look at his face in the video, like this Howley guy talks to him and he's like, hey, can you sit down? He just looks at him. He's like, nope. <laughs> like, obviously, he's dug it on his own volition. But um, did I help him with the sign? Yes, obviously. Did I uh, help him when, like, growing up sort of grabbing his arm and pulling and telling him to go in some places? Did I say, like, Una, hey, could you be eight? Like, you know, you're good. You're good. Yeah, of course. Of course. That's mm-hmm. Any dad would do that. Uh, do I know how to do protests? Did I like help them strategize? What's the best way? Yes, that's 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 what we do. That's yeah. like you know I'm one of the lucky ones where I get like I, I'm an organizer like professionally. So you know all these things like oh the great handwriting. It's like come on yeah yeah I help my son, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm not running from that. 
but it was 100% his idea. Mm -hmm. Like I was, he was watching that, that documentary, um, you know, the Dakota 38 of when Lincoln ordered the biggest mass execution of all time against the Sioux people. And he, he already sat out like the kindergarten portion last year of Lincoln Day. But this time he's like, I don't want to sit on, sit out. I want to protest. How old is your son? He's almost seven. So that, what, that's... He was six. Okay. But for, for context, he, he was born after the Trump election. Like mm -hmm. Women's March, George Floyd, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So he's... That's he's just what he knows, it. right? Mm -hmm. He's like, you protest. If you don't, you protest. Like, mm -hmm. that's what you do. And I, and I warned him, like, you know, there's other ways... And like we already talked to like, like talked to teachers. Like I talked to the teacher. We go and we talk to the principal. He's like, no, you already talked to him when I, you know, when I wore the, the clothes that he didn't like, or he mm -hmm. well, he had like his black nail polish on. He was trying to be all cool, and you know, some teacher said stuff. So I had to talk to the principal about that. I'm like, I don't want to be a parent. That's all I was talking to the principal. Mm -hmm. So he just like protests. I'm like, okay, I'll support you. And Brad, that video of the attack though, that was like only one. Yeah. There's like plenty. Like I'm not gonna scrap because it's a whole mob. You know what I mean? So I was heavy, but yeah. he handled it. He took it in stride. I warned him. I'm like, you know, this is going to get intense depending on how many people. And he's just like, I know some people will hate me. Some people will like it. And that's just how it goes. And he's right. Like mm -hmm. even, even when it hit social, it was unfortunate to him that people could recognize me. Cause like, mm -hmm. as soon as it happened, they're like posting on my account and all that. But like all the meme accounts was like on the side of the, of the mob at mm -hmm. first it was against my son and it was striking i was like oh seriously you guys and then you watch in the course of two hours like all these hawaiians really realizing what the sign said and thinking about it and realizing that their reaction was more because like more from a place of like not shame but like ah fuck like yeah like how come i didn't notice this mm -hmm. like that's why they reacted the way they did and then it came around and all like the meme accounts just kind of pivoted mm -hmm. 180 i was like okay um, I appreciate it, but it was like a hectic day, bro. Yeah. Like, I don't know. And then the principal goes, hey, he, the principal set out this thing, like, thank you for keeping calm. Nobody was threatened during the event. Everyone's safe. And I was like, that kind of gaslighting. And I was mm. like, bro, what? Like, we all saw the video. What you mean? Yeah, you were um, attacked. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, you just condoning. At that point, like, we yeah. like, is it safe for him to go back to school if this mm -hmm. is the reaction from the principal? But, you know, I'm not the kind, like, trying to make a lawsuit or anything. So, um, yeah, that was heavy. That was a heavy time. But he was in good spirits. You know, the next day, a lot of Hawaiian mm -hmm. leaders, like, big Hawaiian leaders were reaching out. Um, even, like, the intertribal council, like, the non-native folks mm -hmm. who live in Hawaii, they came by, did a ceremony for Laguna and um, came by the house. And, you know, they, they knew the, the elder from the Sioux tribe that, like, led the the ride and like told them about it and it was it was really sweet so mm -hmm. um you know i'm just glad to see the conversations happening yeah this happened i mean we protested the mckinley statue before too and it was super unpopular and you've seen that change like people are there's, you're getting more sympathy around there too so hopefully people understand like how weird the colonial history of these schools are he had a school shooting drill two days ago and you, there's a password, so you know it's another student entering the house, um, entering the classroom, and not a shooter. And the password is Abe. That could literally be the last word the kid says before he gets shot. Abe. Abe. And it's like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, what's wrong with you guys? It's weird. It's like North Korea or something. Mm. Like, why, why are we worshiping uh, politicians? Why are you making it? They say, Kanel, why are you making it political? Why are you make it political? We mm. never made it political. This one politician you're worshiping is shrine like an idol. Mm -hmm. You Christian, what about Leviticus 26? You know? Yeah. So I, I know it was unpopular with a lot of the parents there, but I think it wasn't so much about the, um, I guess, praising Abraham Lincoln. It was more about they just wanted their kids to have the play, right? Mm -hmm. uh, at least that's what could I could be anything. Th that's that's what I figured. Could be Mayday. Yeah. Could be Lilio Kalani. Yeah. Could be Kuhio. Could be Ke Likolani Day. Could be whatever's. And so it's like that's that's the question, right? It's not about relitigating Lincoln. Um, I mean, look, if we're going to celebrate an American politician, it, he better be spotless. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're going to push our own leaders aside, um, it better be a flawless man. And there's mm -hmm. no such thing as a flawless man. So like in that case, like let's. Like they don't even have the Makua program anymore, the Kupuna program. Mm. Like remember when we was when we was growing up, I had like the 
the aunties would come over, teach us Hawaiian stuff. Oh, you went, you went. Oh, yeah. I, I, I had, there, there was just, that, that was, was just all, my cool. That was all the teachers. <laughs> <laughs> was everybody. But, like, they used to have these programs for, for Hawaiian <laughs> education in the public schools, and they got rid of them. They don't even have May Day in ever. Oh, really? Yeah. This is the only event they have that's big like that. Mm. So, I, that, so, in that case, yeah, I sympathize with the parents, mm. but also, like, why? Why Lincoln? Why not something that's, like, honors yeah. our actual history of ever? Bihuliho or something. Yeah. Yeah, or yeah. like a Sakata day. It doesn't even have to be Hawaiian. Like, yeah. if it's mostly Filipino and, like, what, what's the history out there? Like, my kid's Filipino, too, mm-hmm. you know? Like, um, yeah. But, yeah, when you teach them that he- heroes look like Lincoln, because the lyrics are literally, Link- Mr. Lincoln is my hero more than a president to me, mm-hmm. put to the tune of a pop song. It's so very North Korea-ish. Um, what are you really telling them? And you say plantation workers look like you, mm-hmm. but, like, heroes look like that. Um, that has long-term effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That... That is a, another way of almost like brainwashing kids growing up. It, you just don't know, you know, even like singing the um, Pledge of Allegiance and like, you know, the American National Anthem. I never learned it in my school because we did Hawaiian history and Hawaiian national, Hawaii Pono'i, all three verses, <laughs> which I hated, but I, I, I love and appreciate now. Um, but it's just, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's just a way that... W- we do things or we learn things that you don't realize um, the repercussions of it until you get older, like how how much you couldn't really think for yourself, you know? It's a, it's crazy because, like, all these kids, they're going to... Yeah. What if they really... They, they're living in Hawaii and they, have, they know nothing about the overthrow or what America did to Hawaii. You know, I'm not saying everybody needs to care as much as we do, but at least you should know and be able to like choose your side, you know. For it's yeah, I mean it's like accuracy in education. Mm-hmm. It's 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 right now it's political. Mm-hmm. What 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 I'm coming from is like we should depoliticize it and just show the whole picture. Mm-hmm. Because when you only tell one side of the story, that's a political choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like the misinformation, like the fallout from like Instagram, for example, you have people saying like, oh. Y- like Lincoln freed freed slaves. Like you should be thankful. But in fact, there was no slavery. The, the, like slaves were already free in Hawaii before the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm-hmm. Like our our elite did that. Um, oh, it, it, uh, America gives you free speech. No, free speech was enshrined into the Hawaiian Constitution before America. So like all these things that we give credit to America for is not true. Like, oh, this public education system is American. No, the DOE under the Hawaiian government was better than the DOE now. We're the most literate nation in the world. Yep. We had a prison system that didn't mass incarcerate Hawaiians. Mm-hmm. And we barely had any homelessness. We had virtually zero homelessness. So what did America provide us that we didn't already have in our own government? Right? So it's like, oh, we should be Problems. grateful for them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, you know, it's not, it's, it, it's, there, there are positives, of obviously, to being a part of the greatest empire in the history mm-hmm. of the world, right? Like, you know, if you can't beat them, join them kind of mm-hmm. thing. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't make it on our own. In fact, we have made it on our mm-hmm. own. So, like, but people just don't get that by and large. It's just like a minority of people who even know the history, not just up to the overthrow, but after the overthrow. Mm-hmm. We were still going. We created beauty in terms of government and social structures. Yeah. Well, nobody knows the history. If you don't, you don't know what you don't know, yeah. right? It's like we grow up in this society where it's like America is everything. You know, we have all these things because we're American. You know, so unless you know the history, you're not gonna know that. You're yeah. not gonna know we had electricity before the White House. Yeah. You're not gonna know that we're the most literate state in the U.S. Or I guess I don't know if it's the nation, the nation, and. It wasn't literate in English. It's literate in literacy in Hawaiian, mm-hmm. which is crazy. Yeah. yeah. So crazy that you know we have but to that's always remind why, people. This. That's why they made Eva Elementary mm-hmm. the way they did. That's why they made KS the way we did mm-hmm. to strip us of our language on purpose. Like mm-hmm. KS was the first English school, right? So it's like, how do we how do we use these institutions that were created yeah. to like for our betterment, but also understand the histories, like. It's it, just because of tradition, it doesn't mean it's good. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so awesome conversation. Yeah, we, we got a lot more to talk about, but right now, before we get into Instagram questions, I, I just want to 
present a new segment by our sponsor, KTA Superstores, located on the Big Island. You know, if you're from Hilo, Waimea, wherever, I think they, they even got some stores in Kona. Uh, you know, you, you grow up going to KTA. That's that's the place. I'm sure you've been to one when you were on the Big Island. Yeah. yeah I know the, the Onishi family. They, yeah. Yeah. They, we, they're the best. We love it. So, you know, KTA Superstore started in 1916. Uh, as a modest 500 square foot grocery and dry goods store by Koichi and Tanio Taniguchi. And then since then, KTA has grown to seven store chains serving the residents of Hawaii Island. And it's cool that it's like our own personal, like it's, it's a big island thing, right? So that's why I love it. So I want to present you with one of these beef jerkies that you can take oh. home right after this because just like K- what KTA believes, you're someone special. So you're someone special. And you get to have a beef jerky to take home and eat with your ohana after this. So I know it looks super ono right now. I try some. It's, it's mean. Uh, so just think, be thinking about which one you want to take home. You know, you want the door number one, door number two, door number three. Whatever you want. <laughs> because you're someone special, you get to take one home. Uh, and uh, oh, wow. what's cool about this brand right here, 1916, it's um, one of KTA's signature brand named in to honor the year that K Taniguchi store was founded. So their 1916 products are hand-picked and produced exclusively for Hawaii, bringing the best products from all over the world to you. Yeah, so I, I hope you're hungry after this because <laughs> you get to try some of this 1916 beef jerky. I've yeah, never had it yeah. before they sent it to me. I didn't even know it existed. Oh, sick. Right yeah. Are you a big, big beef jerky guy? Yeah, well, I'm trying to cut back a little bit on the on the <laughs> on the meat, but yeah, bro, it's, it's uh, you know. Yeah, what would you say protein? say is the best beef jerky you've had? Ooh, I don't know. It's a hard one, bro. Yeah, usually uh, the homemade kind is really good. I like the super thin ones that they've been putting out. I don't oh, know like at those, George's Meat Market on, yeah, yeah. On, in Hilo, they have the really thin ones. Yeah, our friend, uh, CEO of Hawaii Fresh, Jared Kushi, his family makes some mean beef jerky and it's my favorite because it's like right between the thin kind mm. and the chewy kind so it's it's like the perfect medium oh yeah and yeah, it's yeah. super flavorful so one day hopefully uh they'll they'll expand it and sell it to the public because that beef jerky is something oh, it's everybody like a has family only, uh, yeah yeah it's only like you only get batch. it once in a yeah, while yeah. you know so that kind yeah but 1916 beef jerky at kts superstars go check them out All right, so we're back with some Instagram questions. I usually just do a couple, but because you got so many, because you have so many people that love and follow you, I'm going to just drop a bunch, all right? This first one comes from Vin Rivera. This person wants to know, what happened now after your son protested in school? What was the school's response? Oh, yeah, that was... um, The school responded kind of shockingly, like, you know... No one reached out, right? You think if if I was a if you was a teacher or a principal and something like that happened with the whole mob and the videos came out over the weekend, you'd reach out to the family whether or not you agree with them. Um, that didn't happen, and you know I talked about the response, what they wrote, the official DOE statement that like thank you everyone who who like nobody overreacted, everyone was calm. Thank you for being calm, and no one was in danger. Um, that wasn't, it, it, it was like invalidating, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was like, when you make statements like that, then it kind of gives a green light for people to act the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, my kid got to go to school the next day. So that's where it got kind of weird. Like, it's not like I was afraid. I mean, I didn't show up in Kamakana Ali that weekend because I didn't want to start trouble. But you know, once things started coming out and more support started happening and all the community leaders came out, like I wasn't scared, but it was more like, would my kid be okay in school? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. That was concerning. And the other part was like, if somebody protested an event, and let's say it was in my old district in Kihei, I was principal, I was an elected official, I would have got on the mic and I would have calmed everyone down. Even if they completely disagree with me, if it's something that I don't support at all. Someone said like, like someone was going on like a anti-gay or anti-Hawaiian rant or something. Mm -hmm. I still go up there and calm people down. That didn't happen. Not one elected official had the sense of public leadership to step up like that when a child was getting booed by hundreds of people and everybody yelling F you and all that. Mm-hmm. So that was the more disappointing thing. They were saying that to your kid? Bro, you should watch some of the other videos. You could, you could hear wow. them. It's really intense. Uh, I mean, maybe they're singing at me, but from yeah. his perspective, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, 
How how is your kid now? Yo, like right. You want to talk about Vivo Ole? Like, that kid is like... Really? I mean, he's still a kid, you know? Yeah. So he's just like, oh, that was intense. Anyways. Anyways, uh, <laughs> let's uh, hop on Fortnite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Pokemon. Like, <laughs> anyways, Dad, what's your favorite Pokemon? <laughs> I'm like, I wasn't trying to, uh, like, do the Pokemon thing with him because, you know, it's just like, it's so basic. But then, like, after that, I, we went to Pro Ridge and got, like, <laughs> the ones he wanted because, nice. you know. A little reward. Yeah. Yeah. That is a very brave thing. Whether you agree with it or not to have... Somebody at seven years, six years old? Yeah. So do that. I mean, that's... Well, I walked up to him with a sign, right? Because that was the plan. Like, after his class walks up for their part, I'll give him a sign. And I walk up to him, like, hey, you don't have to do this. You know, like, I didn't realize there's, like, this much people. He's just... I'm like, how do you feel? He goes, I feel relieved that I didn't think you'd get me to sign. And he took the sign and he went up. <laughs> <laughs> I feel relieved. I was like, what? Okay. <laughs> so then... Um, and then when, like, my wife started crying, when Carl started crying... Because, you know, he's up there and people started mm. booing and stuff. She, like, put her fist up. And then I just saw him just, like, mm. and his face just didn't budge. Like, no tears, nothing. I was like, bro, what? Yeah. At that point, I was like, okay, there's, like, this ancestors here or something. Yeah. Do you think people were also mad because maybe they thought this was, like, a uh, like a stunt? Like, oh, this is for so you can get a picture, a video for followers on Instagram to, you know, show, like, you're doing something? Do you think that's yeah. what people thought? Yeah, yeah, but the thing is, most of the people that are saying this stuff are people who always oppose me, mm -hmm. usually on partisan grounds. Like, you know, they don't agree with my stance, they don't agree with my party, mm -hmm. whatever. But, like, the thing is, you could always count on me and my family for coming out for any issue that matters mm -hmm. to our community. That's why we did the power line thing. You know, that's why we do missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Like, it doesn't matter. You know, we'll be out. We'll work with anyone. So I think that's what people are starting to realize. Uh, like, we just do it. Uh Again, not worth it. Not worth the haters and mm -hmm. the stuff people say. I've been purposely, if you notice, purposely trying to do more behind the scenes stuff, mm -hmm. more music, more like not political stuff. But you know, when you raise your kid in Kuwait, eh? <laughs> you can't avoid it. So. Yeah, it's hard to get away from it. Yeah. So how do you how do you deal with these haters and people that don't disagree, don't agree with you? Um, organize. It's just like you know, if if. If you're saying things that people need to hear and feel what is porno and they care about too, maybe they feel it, but they don't know how to communicate it yet because they're just busy doing their day jobs. Uh, and you talk to enough people, you'll have, like, you'll build support. And we saw that with Mauna Kea. In the beginning of Mauna Kea, only less than 20% of people stood on our side, right? It was mm -hmm. like 16% or something. And by the end was even Hawaiians. We didn't have the majority of Hawaiians back then. Um, in 2015, now it's like 70, 80 percent Hawaiians, more maybe more, 50, 60 percent of the general public, and like this is one thing that I think a lot about. Like after somebody in our Lahui, or you know, even if you're black, indigenous, immigrant, Kanaka Maoli, we we like really sing praises to our leaders who have left us. But what about when they were alive? You know, like Martin Luther King wasn't a popular man. Mm -hmm. Haunani K. Trash, George Helm, they were considered really radical. A lot of Hawaiians were like scared to even associate with them during their time. Mm -hmm. So there are people now that like stick their neck out. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about like a leader who's been doing this for a long time. You know, um, like Anti Pua Case, for example. I mentioned Anti Noi Goodyear Kapua, um, Professor Goodyear Kapua. Um, uh, like Kimo Keo out on Maui, guys, uh, guys that are like actually like been leading this like sovereignty movement and just like native rights movement for their whole lives. And I just like they might seem unpopular at times or like hard to get close to because you might lose respect from you might get raised eyebrows in your mm -hmm. family. But I just challenge people like take the risk, like give them the lay while they can still smell the flowers. Mm. Yeah, and I think it just starts by having an open mind and being able to listen and m being prepared to hear something that you might not agree with. But that's okay, because it's a conversation that needs to happen. And if you're only listening to one side the whole time, you know, it's just like you're, you're just going to be in an echo chamber the whole entire, your whole entire life. And the idea of moderation, yeah. like every time you hear like, oh, why can't you just be more un unity? Like, mm -hmm. why don't we, why don't you try to shy towards unity, Kaniela? And it's like, okay, what does that look like? Does that mean playing both sides or mm -hmm. taking a stance right in the middle? Mm -hmm. 
um, or does that mean something else? But when you look at the issues we're most united on now, we all think a whole lot of it was bad. Mm-hmm. Now, we all think Social Security, Medicare, those are the most popular mm-hmm. issues in America. When those issues, we all think black people should vote. We all think women should vote. When those issues were being discussed, they were the most controversial mm-hmm. issues. They were unpopular. They, Good point. And they're the most polarizing issues. So, like, sometimes if you want to create unity, you got to be able to stand strong, mm-hmm. strong on, on, like, on the side of um, the opponent. Yeah. They say if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for everything, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, going off that, Bryson Keho wants to know, what path do you see forward of U.S. recognizing Hawaiian sovereignty? Ooh, you know what would be good for this is Professor um, Williamson Chang. He, he explored this the most on the U.S. level, mm-hmm. but... Um, it, the path has to be through power. I think we've we're we're fortunate enough where the Renaissance happened, the first Hawaiian Renaissance, and like my mom's not Hawaiian. She knew she wanted to marry a Hawaiian because it was cool. When she was coming <laughs> of age in the seventies, it was yeah. cool. So um, that Renaissance was a big deal, and part of that was we we learned that well, it was immoral to overthrow the kingdom. It was illegal to overthrow the kingdom. And we have all the case law, you know, Keanu Sai, Williamson Chang, they all showed us um, the paths in the international law, in national law. That's not the problem, right? It's not a legal or a moral path. It's a path that, it, that needs to be political. And when I say political, I don't just mean like voting. I mean, we got to build the power among the people in order to influence. Um, so, you know, another related question is like, oh, why don't you do a bill that like gives land back to natives, or why don't you do a land that like a bill that succeeds that succeeds uh, Hawaii from the U.S. And it's like because it won't pass. Mm-hmm. Like it's y'all be one vote and it's 76 legislators. If we want a bill like that to pass, you got to shift the whole narrative, like the whole public consciousness, and that takes community organizing and you know building the Ahui door to door. Um, call by call and like having conversations with like your neighbors and friends bringing them together and you know going out from there and that's you know like Kue petition days that was that was what was happening PKO protect Kaolawe Ohana and like Kalohui Hawaii that was their theory of change Mm -hmm. and at some point we dropped off and thought like oh if we just elect people and like vote right then it'll magically fix itself but like no it has to happen like on the ground level if you really want to change hearts and minds because, yeah, change hearts and minds, build the power, then impact um, the political world. But we already have the solutions. We already have the moral stuff on our side. Um, now's the time to hold them on. Mm-hmm. Love it. Second Hawaiian Renaissance. <laughs> yeah. We were, this is the, what, it was six, wait, nine, seven, 50, 50, 50 years after the start of the Renaissance. Right. So it's like the second half of the, the century. Yeah. Where it's like we got all the momentum, we got we had a, we have a, our own mahina olelo Hawaii, we have la hoi hoi, yeah. we have all these things, these events that are uh, celebrating our history, which is really cool, which we haven't had in yeah. a long time. It's really cool. We got all the momentum, so now we just gotta keep climbing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ik Coco Seven wants to know: Do you have any tips on decolonizing your mindset and achieving internal prosperity? Ooh, that's, that's heavy. Deep. That's heavy. <laughs> uh, I should have said this actually as a as an answer to the two party system because we're told like they're two friends of mine, progressive mm-hmm. and conservative. Um, but really, it's like as as anybody, but especially as Kanaka Maoli, we should be thinking about like what's decolonial like what's the what's the way to think about this issue that isn't informed by like you're saying all the things that we were force fed as kids um as to like the the proper haole way um and once you do that you can really like break down the barriers between our communities between educated educated hawaiians and like you know working class hawaiians and realize that like our value is is much deeper than what we produce for for you know the moneyed world. Um, in terms of like doing it for ourselves, our kids in like the Noel program on the west side, and what they do is when they come into the classroom, they check in on like their well-being, but in different dimensions. It's like how's your AI doing? How's like the Pilina? You know how's your um, you know relationships? How's your like what's your relationship with with uh, the environment mm-hmm. 
and just like all these different dimensions. And I think that is a really good framework. Mm -hmm. I never did it myself, but just witnessing it for the first time, I'm like, wow, that's so healthy, especially for a boy who doesn't know how to express it, who's like taught to like hold the bottle up their emotions so they explode. Like being able to express it, but not just like in a, I feel happy kind of way, but like in different native dimensions. It's pretty powerful. It's very spiritual. It sounds yeah. Like. And that, and there's mm -hmm. a spiritual component mm -hmm. too, like how you feel spiritually. It's like, Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah interesting I'm, i've never heard of anything like that when i was in school but i mean i feel like a lot of times you kind of you kind of just figure it out on your own yeah like what is your relationship to hula to aina to me'ai to food you know all these things and you're taught at least in the hawaiian emergent schools to think about all the kauna the, the hidden meanings behind everything and like yeah. everything has 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 meaning like even stuff as simple as if I'm sitting down on the ground with my legs crossed, legs out, and you step over me, you're taking my mana. You're taking like my my power, my essence. So you have to walk back to restore that and then walk around me. You know, stuff as little little as that, you know, significance that till today I carry, even though I wasn't interested in it. Um, but it's Hawaiian values. It's not American values. Yeah, and that's an example of even though I didn't care about it, it still stuck with me. So, people who have their kids doing, you know, in these very American schools, American schooling systems, Ameri the American way of life is gonna stick with them as they get older. Just like how the Hawaiian way of life stuck with me as I get older. You know, that's just an example. Yeah. That I, I didn't even know until now as I'm saying this out loud, you know. Okay, next question. Nicole Sandry wants to know, how will he encourage youth to stand up without alienating their community? Um, that's an interesting. Well, there's a lot of presumptions in that question, right? Uh, so I guess the, the assumption is that when my son decided to kue, he alienated his community. Well, we should unpack that. Like, alienated from what? Mm -hmm. From us? From my family? Like, are we a pariah now? And if we are, why is that? Is that our fault? Um, are we alienating from the mainstream sort of ideology? Some people think you're non-ideological. It doesn't exist. You know, <laughs> you're either in a minority ideology or in the majority ideology. And given the state of the world, I think the majority ideology is a really extreme one. <laughs> Um, and not a productive one. So, you know, who, who's alienating who? Um, and where does the onus fall on the alienation? Like, is it the person who's getting alienated that is to blame? Mm -hmm. Or is it the people who's alienating? And what can we do to make a community less alienating in the first place for someone who just simply asking for more visibility of their culture and to stop being in, invisibilized by the state, the education system, because that's that's all it was. Mm -hmm. So how is is this something that you would encourage other people to do? You know, other parents who have kids that feel the same way or maybe like different environment, maybe try a different tactic. Do you think it was successful? I think it was successful. Mm -hmm. We got people talking. Yeah. I think and thousands that's of, all that yeah. matters. Right? And I think hundreds of thousands of people learn something. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, I didn't know anything about <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, yeah, like, you know, yeah. all that stuff. I mean, so, I don't really know American history, to be honest. I don't yeah. really. The, we learn a little bit of it, but I don't really remember it. So even like this, the sign alone that you had, like, I didn't know. Yeah. Like, I, didn't, I didn't look at it as somebody who was pretty, you know, neutral and uh, open minded. I didn't look at it and like instantly get offended or reacted in a certain way. It chose a side. I just took it as information. You know? Yeah. And if more people just take things as information, you know, it, you maybe you wouldn't have these overreactions. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so I guess the question, they're, what they're alluding to is like, is there a way I could have presented that information? Could we have proactively gone to the principal and asked them to put this in the program? Um, maybe. 
Do I think that would have worked? No. This guy's like obsessed. He has a per personal infatuation with Lincoln, the principal. So it's like it's a weird you go, thing. Right? You go into his house, he just yeah. has like top hats. You got beards <laughs> yeah. that he puts on at different times. Yeah, no, totally, <laughs> bro. This is, it's a strange vibe. You got pennies everywhere. When you when Stop. you zoom out and you you look at these kids using playing pop songs around an idol of a politician who did nothing for their school or has no stake in their yeah. community other than a rich former principal bought the statue that's the only connection yeah. uh it's it's bizarre bro it's mm -hmm. like kim jong un stuff yeah have you ever listened to the um do you listen to joe rogan podcast maybe a few episodes yeah once in there, one, there's this know, one so. episode that i would encourage everyone to listen to i just um i listened to it last year but i was telling my girlfriend to listen to it so she started listening to it with you you me soon or something like that it's this lady this um korean lady who was born in north korea and she got out so she's telling her story about her time in North Korea and how they didn't even know there was an outside world. She's never seen a, a map of the world. They have one station where it's just the news where you're, you're told exactly what you have to do. You have no control over your day. The government doesn't feed you anything. Everything is just controlled. You have no control over your life and you don't even know what's out there. And North Korea purposefully doesn't feed the people because they want them to starve so they're not thinking about kue. They're not thinking about a revolution or anything. They're just trying to think about how am I going to get my next meal? You know? So st stuff like that, <laughs> when you think... Um, you, you'll hear so much more about her story when you listen to this episode. I think it's like you, you, me soon or something. Just like, just Google it, YouTube it. It's a heavy episode. I mean, it's a, that's an yeah. extreme example. Yeah. But, but you see a lot of parallels. Yeah. 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 I mean, like we were these bongos, right? Our, our plantation, like history. Well, you're not, what, what other, what other ethnicities are you? Other uh, Portuguese, Korean, Japanese. Yeah. So like, your ancestors were mm -hmm. bongos. Um, if they're from Hawaii, if they were came with a wave of Japanese, and those bongos were made, they're a number, it means number, right? There's a tag that was made in the same um, place that the slave tags were made for the plantations in the South. Um, they were paid with money that could only be spent back in the plantation. It was like funny money. Um, and they were purposely, like the Filipinos, for example, they went to the Visayas, they brought them in, but these people were more educated and more prone to um, protest because they, they protested back home at times and they realized like, oh, we got to find poorer people. So they went to other areas like Ilocos Sur, Ilocos Norte, where people were more impoverished and would be more grateful for the opportunity to work even under extremely bad conditions um, in the plantations. So it was, it was labor trafficking mm -hmm. um, that brought them in as indentured servants, uh, AKA slaves. Um, but that's not the history that we're taught. Right, we're taught that like, oh, the good days of the plantations they where came you, had that, you had that with, viral video with a knife, with the with, lunch pack. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like cool, but there's, but the the reality was like, we had to fight for like just weekends or eight hour days. Like mm. our ancestors bled for that stuff, mm. and that's not the history they're teaching in Eva. In fact, Eva was created that that school was created in order to keep Filipinos and Hawaiians in that lower class and not let us rise. So these traditions that come from there, like. It, I think it's time to revisit them. If you don't want to change them, fine. If you still want to do Lincoln Day, fine. But at least understand like why it's there and like how it's impacting us today. Yeah. Question. Question everything. Question. 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 Yeah. All right. Uh, next question comes from the same person. How does he take personal accountability when his actions don't yield expected results? And um, you can expand on this. It doesn't have to be just like protesting. I would say just like. Yeah. When you want to do something and you just don't succeed, you know? Yeah, I mean, you got to learn. You, you got to try to turn your failures into lessons. Mm -hmm. I like, you know, I ask for that groundedness often from my community, for people. Like, I try to find people I'm accountable to, accountable to on purpose, beyond my own family. Um, but, I don't know. First of all, it wasn't my protest. I don't know what my son was thinking other than just trying to tell the other side of the story that wasn't being told. Mm -hmm. So in that case, the intentions did happen. Like that, that is what we attended, the consequences. Um, what I, the consequences that transpired is that, I, that I didn't intend was the violence. Mm -hmm. um, so where is the accountability there is a good question. Mm. And do you think, you, th you think the school should be held accountable? Uh, I mean, 
I like I, the thing is like I support the public school system because mm-hmm. like I think it's important. It's a good use of taxpayer dollars to make sure we're all educated. But you know what's being taught there is is also important mm-hmm. if you really want these kids to rise mm-hmm. um, from where they are. And uh, so I don't want to like drag the public schools. Yeah, yeah. But like, and it's an isolated incident. Yeah, it's an isolated incident. Mm-hmm. But also, like, there needs to be a more proactive conversation mm-hmm. of how can we. How can we lift up our own and stop setting aside our own heroes? Or even is it even appropriate to have like individual mm-hmm. heroes as part of a school curriculum? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and not just like a more accurate representation of history. Yeah, I think the problem is that n- just not everybody cares like we do. Not everybody. I'm, I'm just being super honest. Not everybody cares about Hawaiian history, Hawaiian culture like we do. Even if you live here, there are some people that don't care to learn Hawaiian. They just they like living here. They like what they're doing. They like going to their, you know, I don't know, clubs and yeah, you know, whatever yeah. you do, you know, going to the college, getting an office job. They're okay with that, you know. I think yes, it'd be cool for us to shift the mindset of everybody. And there, we have this whole community behind us thinking like we do. But I think we're we're still a long way from that happening but we're not gonna stop (laughs) yeah i mean that's always been the case right like people are always especially the working people who need to not like the rich or the fancy jobs um they always are it's difficult to get engaged in the political sphere because the world is hard enough as it Mm -hmm. is to manage in fact especially out in like our area where it's like you you move west side you finally get that house you're finally safe. There's a lot of problems in the world, but you're in your own little community. Like, you don't want someone to go and pop that bubble. Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what I can empathize with, especially if you're in my kid's actual first grade class during the, and was in the same presentation. Like, I feel for them, like, because that's it's just like shocking. You're trying mm-hmm. to shield your kid from that. Mm-hmm. And I just challenge like we all have our own parenting styles, but I challenge um, parents that you can't shield your kids from everything though Mm -hmm. like you think this is bad like you just ruin their day like wait until what you know think about what you had to experience growing up Mm -hmm. and like what your kids will have to face and like what are we doing now to prepare them for that so i'm not gonna like tell people how to parent and i ask people not to tell me how to parent um but i do like it's always uncomfortable to to see change happen Mm -hmm. um but like if people weren't doing what what my son tried to do we still think it's okay to you know that women aren't voting mm-hmm. <laughs> we still think it's okay that to like i don't know throw rocks at gay people mm-hmm. like it's just like we come a long way because of like radical disruptive action like this would you consider yourself radical <sighs> no i mean i consider the status quo a radical departure from what's mor- moral and what's natural, like the way the world is structured right now, where, you know, three Holly dudes have more money than half of everyone in America, or how all most of our institutions here are controlled by like a certain gender and race. It's like, it doesn't feel right or normal. Um, and it's like, why? Questioning why, why is that radical, right? Like it's radical that we have enough wealth right now um, in the state where we don't have to have homeless, Mm -hmm. but we choose as a political choice to maintain homelessness and keep our neighbors unsheltered. Mm -hmm. Like we choose to let corporations drill into our most sacred places, you know, like that's radical. So like fighting that just seems normal. And in the broader context of things, like it's only been this way under like uh, American or Western colonial capitalism for like 0.01% of human existence. Mm-hmm. The not other 99.99% we've been living more like our, our ancestors two, 300 years ago. Um, so, you know, it's a rat, it's a radical departure mm-hmm. from the natural order of things. And just in that short time, we've caused mass extinction. We're causing a climate crisis that could wipe out all humans. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, radical is, is staying the course. Of, of this injustice yeah well i was just thinking about my um when i was talking about the lady from north korea how she's she was saying that they want to keep people starving so that they don't want to make a revolution that's almost like how 
the cost of living is so high here in Hawaii, and we have all this problem, drug use, homelessness, um, obesity, I guess, in some, like, pop population, like, Native Hawaiian community. It's, a, it's like, I think 40-something percent of the Native Hawaiian community is obese, or Polynesian community. Um, so I wonder, yeah, it's like, these things, it seems like it's just, oh, it's just natural. But I guess if you think about it a little bit deeper, it seems like, are they doing this on purpose? So it's like, are they keeping the cost of living really high? So we just have to worry about where our next paycheck is coming from. So we don't have these like revolutionary thoughts. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I try not to impute yeah. intentions because I don't want people imputing my intentions. Yeah. So like, or whether or not they, they want that to happen, they know it's happening. Mm -hmm. They know the system incentivizes that to happen and they're doing nothing to reverse it. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, actions speak louder than I can't, I don't know what's in your heart, mm -hmm. but I know what, what actions you're taking and what actions you're not taking. Yeah. And the things I teach my kids, take what you need, give what you can, are not values. Every native culture had those values. Karl Marx mm -hmm. talks about it and there it's like, oh, it's like a communist. No, it's, it's something that every native culture, take what you need, give what you can. And that's just not a value right now. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's universal, but yeah. it, it, we need to revert back to that. Definitely. Okay. The uh, next cu question comes from Uncle underscore D ninety eight. What do you hope to see for our future generations? Uh, well, I I hope to see an open, just, fair, livable society. Um, the way things are going, not to be alarmist but that doesn't look likely unless there's some radical change. So, you know, back to the question of radical, like, yeah, you need radical change or else things can get really bad. It can get to the point where our kids are going to be having to walk because there's not going to be any more oil left, walk 30 miles just to fetch water, like fresh water um, within their lifetimes. Now, this is no longer like a far off thing. There are heat waves in, in like India and places that are killing thousands of people in one go. Um, there are earthquakes that are happening in like rapid succession that we've never seen before. And it's because of the pollution that we've admitted over the, mm -hmm. the last couple, only the last couple generations. So I, I hope that we step up. When I say we, I mean our generation, Makua, step up and face this problem with the urgency that that it requires because we're not currently like we you know we think okay i if i just drive a little bit less or if i don't drink out of a single use bottle that will do it no because the, there's only 10 companies that admit that cause like or 100 companies causing seven seventy percent of all emissions like it's not just an individual thing like we're going to actually have to at some point face off with those companies that are polluting our aina. So, you know, when I see like that boat right now, that yacht in Honolulu, and people are like actually taking action, removing the high Hawaii and stuff, like I want to see more of that, mm -hmm. um, more of that energy. Um, and if you're not, everyone's role is going to be kue, by the way. Like AI can start with your own actions. Like think about the world you want to see where there's enough resources for everyone, the world that I mentioned that we had, um, no homelessness, no mass incarceration, and just start living it, like be the freedom, be the sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's what I'm hopeful with, like people like you come from your background or like the opportunities that my kid has, where he's actually able to like be brought up in that, in that spirit and education. So um, as, as heavy as what I said, feels um i'm i'm an internal optimist because if i was an optimist why would i be doing this work mm -hmm. right i'd just be hoarding money and taking care of my family yeah you see the bigger picture that, that's what it is you know and it, we we come from uh at least a similar background where we care for this place and we want it to be better not only for ourselves but for our ohana our future generations our keiki our friends and you know everybody so yeah i think we're all on this similar path and we all just kind of have to get on the same page because a lot of times it's kanaka fighting against kanaka i mean even in the video it's a local guy yeah. attacking another another yeah. local guy well if not the same page the same hymn yeah. though, you know like the same yeah i just I, I i really don't like seeing that stuff it's like man we gotta work together yeah, okay. yeah. all right um 
Last question, okay. Uh, Darren Shiroma wants to know why so many Native Hawaiians identify with GOP when the party don't care about Natives. Oh. Uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of <laughs> covered that. Democrats have lost touch with the culture, um, especially, I mean, across America, but especially here in Hawaii. Um, so, like, you know, what, all it takes is someone to just, like, listen to some reggae music, drive a Tacoma, all of a sudden, like, people are paying attention, and then they can just spout off whatever they want to spout off. Even if they're saying, let's cut taxes for the richest corporations, it's like, and then you might trickle down, you might get richer. Like, it might make sense, because this person actually, you can see yourself in that person, um, even if it's not backed by data or history. Uh, Democrats, on the other hand, are just like, Oh, like you're despicable if you don't like Trump or if you like Trump and like that's not going to get anywhere. So um, I think that's why uh, they just feel seen. And like I, I feel like if I wasn't in politics and like organized professionally, I'd probably like be more a lot more sympathetic too to that message because it just it just resonates mm -hmm. more. Yeah. When you explained it earlier, I was thinking about this question, too. And I was thinking that's probably why. <laughs> Yeah. because of what you said so mahalo for reiterating that okay so mahalo for everybody for the instagram questions make sure you leave some for our next guest and maybe a question and we'll make it on the podcast okay we're coming to the back end of the podcast and uh, i just want to dive into our culture a little bit okay um like i was talking about kind of these insecurities um as a hawaiian do, do you have any insecurities about being hawaiian i'm gonna get vulnerable here yeah yeah, um, I mean, always, right? It there's like so there's like the insecurities about being Hawaiian, but then when you look at it, when you zoom out, it's like there's other layers. There's other like some people's activists like to call it intersectionality, right? Like what what is it? It's just about your culture and what is about your race, your background, your wealth background, your you know your job, your education, your uh, your gender, like how is this informing who you are too? So like every time it's like, am I, am I insecure? Cause I'm like not Kanaka cause I'm not in the land enough, but it's like, am I going to be in the land enough? Am I going to be in the enough? If I'm like, if my job is like white collar and like mostly intellectual, um, that's a class issue too. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, it, 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 am I going to feel strong enough and cool enough because like KU cool enough because, um, you know, that's how, like, the Hawaiians were depicted in, like, the movies and stuff, like Jason Momoa kind. Um, yeah, that's a Hawaiian issue, but it's also a, a gender issue, you know, mm -hmm. what it means to be men, what it means to be kane. Um, so it's, like, a it's a tough issue. I feel like most of the insecurities is also intersecting with something else, another mode of, like, societal oppression that we just haven't really thought about much or i haven't thought about much until mm. i was like until very recently uh so i don't know that was a kind of weird answer to it no but that's really interesting i yeah. never thought of it like that i never thought about all these exter the other external factors that go into like these insecurities you know mm. like maybe maybe it's not i'm not insecure because i'm not hawaiian enough or i don't look hawaiian or i am really hawaiian it's because i ha my house isn't as nice as my friend's house yeah. You know, there's but all those, know. those things yeah. or because I don't go to a private school or I don't drive a nice car like this guy or this girl. Yeah, it's a good point. Well, I on never, the flip side, like yeah. maybe you never you haven't been exposed to a little Hawaii because yeah. you haven't gone to immersion and you haven't gone to college. Mm -hmm. Does that make you less Hawaiian? You yeah. just soon brought a work in construction like that's that's an insecurity based in class, too, because mm -hmm. because we have a society that that puts down people who haven't gone to college and makes them feel like they're not as valuable, even though some of the smartest people I know, some of the best organizers I know didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. like, you know, it, sometimes it's helpful. This is why when I say community organized, like you got to have these kind of conversations with people and started realizing like you're a product of all these things. Mm -hmm. It's not just like culture. That's yeah. part of it. But um, there's, there's way more. Dang, you got me thinking. Olelo, yeah, bro, for listen. a lot of people, Olelo Hawaii is That's a, a function one. of class. Yeah. They had pr the privilege to learn it. Not everyone did. Yeah. So, like, I, I just asked people who've been through the system and, like, been through UH and stuff to be, like, to have a little more grace with people who are coming up and learning. Oh, um, even, yeah. especially, including their politics, not just their language. Like, 
you know, it's all connected. So, like, if their politics are bad, like, figure out, meet them where they are and figure out how to, um, you know, have these heavier conversations. I mean, if everybody tried to talk like how we're talking right now, mm-hmm. we'd organize pretty quickly. Yeah. We just, we, we got to have, we got to scale this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I would say I'm insecure that I'm not Jason Momoa. That's that's <laughs> yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I could look like that guy, you know, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> he probably he probably would like to allow like you. He's yeah. probably like everybody has something. That's yeah, the problem yeah, with that like you know the, yeah. the Western standards and like the standards we place upon ourselves is they can never all the way be bad. Yeah. Oh, you think Jason Momoa is better than me? Well, I can Olelo better than him, so. I can speak quite better than Aquaman. Boom. I win. <laughs> Even though it's not a competition. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm all of sharing that. that that's really cool. Okay. Um, one of the, the biggest issue here is uh, housing crisis. Yeah. How a lot of people are getting priced out uh, because it's really expensive to live here, you know? And it's not mainly a native Hawaiian issue, but a lot of our land was taken away, so it kind of is like near and dear to our heart. Mm-hmm. It's like we can't even live on our homeland, you know, because it's a local issue. You know, there's people who are born and raised here who aren't Hawaiian, but they still have a, they, they still struggle living here. Yep, yep. Um, Sorry. I went to this uh, home no. seminar thing recently. Um, they're building the structure called Kui. Kuile, Kuile. Have you heard of it? It's uh, they're, I think like they're saving sixty percent of the, how the the, um, what's it called? Residency, for locals. But they're they're doing it specifically for Kamainas, to make it affordable, for people to live here, which is super cool. Uh, we're starting to see a little bit more of that, but what do you think it's gonna take, for? this place to be affordable for Hawaiians to live and this local people to live. Yeah. Um, we have a ways to go. I mean, just in terms of like units, the house people were short, I think 70,000 units right now. I could be, the number keeps changing. Mm-hmm. Um, in other places where it's really expensive, SF, DC, New York, all on par, LA, all on par with Hawaii. Um, the salaries tend to match. The top five most expensive cities also have like the top five highest salaries. Hawaii is in the top five, but is like 78 when it comes to salaries. It's on par with Oklahoma. Wow. So (laughs) uh, when you look at it that way, like we're going to move. Mm-hmm. There's no unless that changes, we're gonna keep moving away for jobs. We can hope. I'm I'm fortunate enough to have a job that's like based in SF in New York, but I get to work remote from here. I gotta wake mm-hmm. up at four a.m. It's hard, but like oh, you're on West Coast time. It, yeah, I'm, I'm East Coast time. So uh, yeah, so it's hard, but like most people don't have that that luxury. Yeah. So um, that's the, that's a big thing is is getting better wages. Um, second thing is like the amount of debt that we have to take just to like move up like you know i have mm-hmm. i have 50 grand of student loans that should be canceled because it was promised that we get like good enough jobs to make it to the middle class mm-hmm. if we're to get this and it was a promise that they went bad on uh and and then in the broader in like the most direct response to the housing crisis is right now we have a system that says our homes our limited homes are used for speculation like that's the primary purpose of them all these condos in Kaka'ako, people aren't living there full time. Do you think all those high rises, like, and it, if that was the case, all those rich people living in those, um, in those high rises, Nobu wouldn't have shut down. Mm-hmm. Like the restaurants are only there to push up the value of these units so they can sell them for more later. And then you can always replace the restaurant when it goes bad. It's like this kind of gross model, right? And meanwhile, like they're sitting there vacant. There's no one even, they're just sitting there so they can appreciate. Mm-hmm. And there's all these homes, and right down the street are unsheltered hawaiians, and they're not in the homes. And just like think about like what our ancestors would think about that. Like that doesn't make any sense, bro. So until we start to think of housing as meant to house people, and not as a tool for the rich to get richer through mm-hmm. speculation, then it's not going to fix itself. Because w- when you talk about that program where it's like 60% reserved. 
a developer has to kind of do this with the kindness of their heart, or we have to subsidize that developer to get richer using taxpayer money. So mm -hmm. it's like we're still paying for it. Um, and we can't rely on that. Like we can't rely on people to make less money. That's not how business works. Mm -hmm. That's not how capitalism works. So we actually got to like change the underlying purpose of housing and c come from a more needs-based approach versus a, a profit-based approach mm -hmm. um, to housing. And it, it's been done. It's been done in Hawaii before America. And it's been done even now, like in, in places like Vienna, in Scandinavia, in Singapore, there's different models. Um, you know, sometimes you have like this saving that builds up automatically as a teenager. And by the time you're 25, you automatically get a three bedroom unit. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can keep it and sell it. There's other models where there's social housing for everyone. And you know, in America, we think of public housing as like rugged kind of like the worst housing. Mm -hmm. But in those places in Vienna, rich people decide to live in social housing because it's better than like the private alternative. Mm. It's like beautiful, you know, like, the, really? like, and you're mixed income. So like you're building community, mm -hmm. like it's not in class. You're bubbles. not in a bubble. Yeah, you're exactly. You're not at the wildlife country club. Yeah. And until Saturday. we start, like, <laughs> until we actually, um, like start changing the whole paradigm around housing, mm -hmm. Um, we're gonna keep seeing people moving away. The, the, that band-aid solution is about like a couple buildings is good, mm -hmm. great for those people doing it, yeah. but like it's not gonna actually stop the boat from sinking. It's not sustainable, you think? <sighs> nah, it's like bailing, them out, bailing out a canoe with a spoon, bro. Mm. Yeah. Well, I hope, we, I hope something happens in the, in the near future. Again, bro, you gotta get money out of politics because it's these yeah. luxury developers that are giving massive amounts mm -hmm. of money to fund these candidates. And then when they get in, every time somebody wants to do something like this, a politician wants to do like a big uh, like revamp housing, uh, they get shut down or they get challenged, they get primaried or they get mm -hmm. like, you know, defamed or like sued or something by yeah. these developers. So um, that, that's for organized. One plug uh, would be our Hawaii. Uh, if you like the organization that's most focused right now on getting money out of politics is our Hawaii. So mm -hmm. if you want to join um, uh, the organization to like testify at legislatures and all that, you can do it there. Mm -hmm. Or if you just want to be a leader in your own community, there's ways like you, you can hold events, knock on doors that we can help uh, facilitate with. Awesome. Yeah, go check that out, everybody. Well, for sharing that. If you had to live somewhere else, say, it just the median price of a house became 2.7 million dollars <laughs> and we just could not afford to live here where where else would you want to live i mean i don't want to live anywhere else but here but you know this That's is just tough. hypothetical um honestly probably outside of america yeah same yeah it's just like you don't want to like you don't want to be a settler, and it's like the whole thing. Uh, it's like trying to figure out your place, because like ideally you'd want to live in like Aotearoa or something like mm -hmm. for me something that's like similar. But then on the other hand, like I'll be perpetuating like what I don't want to see mm -hmm. here. So maybe like a maybe like a white nation that was like colonial historically, <laughs> like move to Paris or somewhere something. you don't feel bad. Yeah, to do. exactly. <laughs> like Paris was built with slave labor. Like I I could be a settler here and not feel bad. Yeah, you guys owe me. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> that was just a random question. <laughs> okay. Do Do you think um, Hawaii could actually be self sustainable in the, these modern times for like food production and all the things that we need to be? to keep us afloat? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I think we can. Um, the question is like, should we? I don't know, I think that's like a broader conversation. Like as long as the world is operating capitalism, trade is generally a good thing, mm -hmm. as long as it's done in like a fair trade kind of way, it doesn't exploit other countries, um, which is rare, mm -hmm. like I, I should say that. But um, you know, our Ali'i were some of the first to like circumnavigate the world. They, they're really, um, intentional about building like relationships with other nations. Uh, so yes, we should try to be self-sufficient, but not shut ourselves out from the rest of the world. Mm. Okay, let's find a good balance. Yeah. Like tourism, but do it in a different way, for example. Yeah, I, don't know. I mean, tourism seems inevitable. I mean, it mm -hmm. seems like unstoppable, but like it shouldn't be our number one like part of our economy right like that's just un that's obviously going to be unsustainable yeah so, so yeah. what what could be our number one export i, I mean i'm not export um just money maker yeah I mean, good question i mean we you know we can manufacture whatever uh we could 
not focus on exports. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we can focus on uh, needs first. Uh, I mean, if we were to sell off, like, oh, I don't know how radical I should get here. I guess if, if there's a lot of, let, let, let's go to the, let's talk about the, the, so our three biggest pillars of our economy, right? Tourism, military, and real estate speculation. Mm-hmm. Um, military could be, it's like, it could be bigger than tourism, um, or we could replace military with something because they control like a third of this island, for example, almost, um, or like the federal government controls a third of the island, military about 25%. But if we were to take back that land, uh, if we could do whatever, we, we could, could farm, things. we could grow things, we could, you know, manufacture mm-hmm. factories, whatever we want. Uh, but it requires the land, right? So, um, one thing that I'm grateful that I, I got to learn economics in college is like sometimes you need to see economic sunsets before you see sunrises. Um, and like as long as we keep subsidizing um, and distorting the market uh, of tourism through like you know, our government paying for their ads, for example, for mm-hmm. hotels through HTA. Um, it, it's not going to be like a free economy anyways. Mm-hmm. And as long as the gov- the military controls all this land, uh, we're not going to be able to actually, uh, you know, be self-sufficient again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, lot to think about. Lots yeah, think we can pretend that, that we can yeah. like be self-sufficient and not touch the militarization issue, but it's not realistic. Yeah, because I know there are people who say... Uh, we we could do it all on our own, you know. It's possible if we really needed to, you know. But ninety percent of the things we have are imported, mm. so take that away, and we got a long road ahead of us. I mean, I would love to see it one day, but yeah. I just I, I I ask only because I I want I don't have like the the knowledge that EK of how realistic it is. The path there seems yeah. seems near impossible. Mm-hmm. Like I don't I don't know the brand of your shirt. I imagine it's a native designer. Yeah, snazzy golf boy. Shout out to them. Yeah, yeah, native designer. But like, where does the cotton come from? Or in that mm-hmm. case, like the rayon. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, are we gonna be growing cotton fields yeah. here on Oahu? Like, um, so yeah, there's ha- there's probably have to be some realistically some kind of trade aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, Maybe not. Maybe we'd have to completely change our, our lives and the way we dress in mm-hmm. natural fibers that being grown here. That's possible, too. It's going to take a complete revamping of yeah. our own minds and education systems. And I, if we're isolated, if we're on TikTok and seeing other clothes, is that even going to work? Are we going to have to like be like North Korea and just mm-hmm. cut off all communication with the outside world? So, you know, um, I'm more concerned rather than like, can we be self-sufficient? I mean, the answer is yes, we can. But just like, how do we get there from now? Mm-hmm. Because we, we were we were in the past, right? We had a million people on this island without any imports. Mm-hmm. Like that was the case. But uh, can we get there again? I don't know. Um, I'm more concerned about like, can we meet the human needs of people? Um, and the answer to that is yes. And the solutions are actually pretty clear. And we can achieve it within 10 or 20 years with the political will. If we're to build enough power in our communities to be unignorable to politicians and corporate actors, then we have enough for everyone here. Now, people like Larry Ellison or Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos will have less. They'll still be filthy rich. They'll still have more than their kids will ever be able to spend. Mm-hmm. But we'll all have enough. And mm-hmm. like that's the world that I'm that I think we can get to. Uh, we just gotta we just gotta organize and um, and Oman Yeah, love for, that. Mahalo. Well, what do you think is the most important lesson you've learned in your career so far? Uh, that going from the outside to the inside doesn't fix things, and going to the ins and like acting like the inside is all full of it, and like doing everything on the outside is not going to fix things either. Everything got to be like an inside-outside strategy. So if you see a Kanaka that's like in the system, trying to change things, like in the American system, um, show them some grace. If you see somebody that you think should be pro, like talking to a board or testifying, but instead they're tying themselves to the cattle guard, show them some grace. We all have a role in this. You know, there's no MLK without uh, Malcolm X. LBJ obviously d- doesn't deserve all the credit for for civil rights as a president. You know, it's like it's a whole ecosystem of actors that make mm-hmm. things happen. So we just gotta like focus on the what the people really doing the harm and the solutions and just kind of give each other the benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Awesome. Okay. What is something you wish people knew about you that they don't? Um, I don't know. We, I don't really like to, I don't, like most of my friends aren't political. <laughs> You know, we just like that's this not really my jam. <laughs> yeah, like people Cruising think like <laughs> yeah, people think like I'm intense. Like I, I just want to be like political all the time. But um, no, I mean I've taken stances. Like I said something about Daniel Inoy once, and like I, there are family members who don't want to talk to me after that. Um, but I'm not like that. Like you can say anything, and mm. I'll still I'll still work with you as long as or talk to you, hang out, mm. whatever. Uh, so I think that can shock some people. Yeah. So when you're not in, I guess, your work environment, your work mode, what are you like? Because <laughs> mm. I feel like this, as humans, we we usually talk about what we're passionate about. And if you're passionate about activism, socialism, whatever, the environment, then that's what you talk about, right? Yeah, I mean, I talk about it at home because, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, Kara's an activist and an organizer and a movement leader and all the things. But, you know, I also just like to play music. I also, my six-year-old really got me into chess recently. Oh, really? He wanted a chess set for Christmas. So Next grandmaster right we there. we just been, like, nonstop playing <laughs> chess. It's pretty goofy. You got the, little, the one um, on the phone, the chess app, chess.com. Yeah, we're one. on that. We're yeah, on yeah. that. I'll add you. But we... <laughs> um, we, uh, you know, there's always like some hobby. Like at one mm-hmm. point, I was in furniture, uh, like making furniture. Uh, like a couple of years ago, I was like really into fitness. So I, I, I always get obsessed about mm. something. There's something weird about my personality is I get obsessive about something. And, yeah. But I do it on purpose. So I don't get obsessed about work. Nice, so I nice. think it would balance. So. Yeah, yeah. It's just like something to distract you. Yeah, yeah. Cooking yeah. is all something. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, we need that. We need that like stress reliever, whatever. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, I got to know before we close this episode, what is your life hack? Oh, yeah. So it's kind of hokey, but I've I've been in situations a lot where you got to be, you got to like really boil down, like you have a decision to make and you have to really boil down to like what I really care about, like what are my values. Mm-hmm. So I write down like my three main values like i have it on my phone in like a little widget Mm -hmm. just three words and it's like for me it's fairness potential and uh like potential for everybody and love like those are the things i care most about for other people it might be like honesty integrity like whatever it is um and i just make sure like i'm I'm, i can see that very easily even when i'm not thinking about it to ground myself in like what i really you know what what really matters to me personally and it's gonna be different for everyone Mm -hmm. but at first i did it i thought it was corny my you know my family thought it was like come on bro but uh it's been really helpful over the last like five or six years Mm -hmm. nice that's good it's just a it's um, it's just a an exercise for decision making yeah yeah yeah. like what what do you really care about yeah exactly roots yeah awesome model for sharing that okay um what are your future goals what do you plan to do after this maybe running for office again no <laughs> nah no plans i mean that's the other thing right like the protest stuff it's like that's not a good issue if you're planning to run you don't want to do that mm-hmm. um i mean maybe you just try to i, I just everyone sh- should have a collect uh, uh like a sense of kuleana for the collective beyond themselves and just like what where are you most impactful mm-hmm. right now for me that's not running um but you never know in the future. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. Well, I'll be following along to see whatever your next thing is. Yeah. I mean, guys should run. More people should yeah. run. Especially the Wahine. Uh, yeah. It's just that once you're in, if you don't have enough support from the outside, you become like the, you know, you get pushed out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's like you need both, right? You need the inside and outside. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I got my last faff. Uh, I finally got the name for this. I do this every podcast and I can always workshopping the name, but I finally got it. It's the last fast fave five. Okay. Last fast fave five. So just five rapid fire questions of like favorites. Okay. Favorite politician slash leader. Ooh. Oh, can I pass? <laughs> I'm going to say something too controversial. I'll keep it easy. Okay. Akaka. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the PC answer. Favorite childhood snack? Uh, ooh. 
I like pickle mango. Oh, that's a that's a great answer. Great answer. Okay, favorite local food place. Oh, the kitchen on Maui. I miss it. Oh, I've never been yeah. there. The kitchen. I like that name, the kitchen. Okay, uh, favorite hobby. Uh, guitar. Guitar. Oh yeah, go check out check out uh, his music. Is it on Spotify? Yeah, yeah. Spotify, YouTube, around, yeah. whatever. Do you plan to re- release any more? Yeah, yeah, get plenty, get plenty. Oh, so. Okay, right on. Just follow along. Okay, and last one, favorite movie. Oh, right now? Yeah. Well, well what about a classic? Favorite song, favorite one? movies. It's like right now. Gotta okay, well, what is it right I, now? Too many. Um, I, I was really into that triangle of sadness. That was funny, right? What that is was, that? That was heavy. I triangle know. of sadness. I never heard of that. Shimacho. Triangle of sadness. Yeah. Who's in it? Uh, I don't know. It's like a big cast kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna look it up. Try and go sadness. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all we have for today. Do you have anything else you want to share? If not, let us know where we can find you. Uh, yep. Uh, Kanyela Ng, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Yeah, he has a lot of good tweets. They've been mentioned on uh, CNN, and you got. Uh, I, I see it all. I I think I've I've seen your tweets before. I've even like known you like or really knew who you were i've seen i remember seeing tweets you're you're pretty active on twitter right yeah, or you have, some, you have some bangers is what i'm saying it de- yeah. it depends like how much i'm actually working yeah if, if i'm on twitter if i'm doing good tweets it's probably because i'm not working enough <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah i've seen people retweet your tweets i guess that's what i meant <laughs> okay yeah so go check them out and um just want to say mahalo for coming on the podcast and talking stories sharing your mona with us uh, I I hope you know to see our Lahui continue to grow and like the visions that we have for this place come to fruition. So keep yeah. doing what you do. No, thanks for having me and thanks for being patient. That was a heavy topic. So mm-hmm. I hope your next guest keeps it nice and light and it's a comedian <laughs> or something. It's another Kamehameha <laughs> grad. That's something we didn't talk about. We have so many Kamehameha grads on here. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, what's up? There's something in the water, the food. I hear okay. Kamehameha has the best food. Maybe that's what it is. They mm. feed you guys really well. Yeah. They used to <laughs> grill cow bee on Maui Camp. It's like you Crazy. hear them like outside. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, mahalo, Kaniela, for joining us on the Hawaii Verse podcast. Check us out on HawaiiVerse.com and download our free app right now to start supporting our local businesses. Spread aloha, be kind to one another, and mahalo for listening to us today. New episodes every Thursday, so make sure you follow us and leave a review. I'm your host, Kamaka, and you'll hear me next time on the Hawaii Verse podcast. Stop. We hope.